Some were crying out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why, why they had come together. <laughs> yeah, it, you know what it reminds me? Like the riots. You know, it, people, you know, they're saying they're, they're protesting George Floyd, but then you got Antifa burning down stuff, and then you have people looting. You know, it, it's just confusion. You know, and, and, and unfortunately, that's how some crowds are. You know, they might, they might be one crowd that are there for a reason, but then there's other that just jump on it and, 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 and then you're like, wait, what is this? I see people going into the Foot Locker. I see people burning down churches. I see people saying um, Black Lives Matter. I don't know what's going on. Hey, but I'm going to preach the word and none of that hate going to work. Hey, hey, hey. Hold on, hold on. Now, I don't know what you heard, but don't believe anyone that can't show you the word. Alright, we're up to Acts 19, you know, like I've been reiterating, a lot of churches won't even touch, well, they'll touch the first few verses here and every other story they'll ignore or, or they'll pick um, something from a story but really won't go deep into it. And that's a, a travesty because every scripture should be given the proper respect. And the Holy Ghost through Luke gave us the book of Acts. And we should try to see what God is trying to tell us, even in the what you might feel is the most obscure verses that might not apply to your life. So with that, we'll start in um, Acts 19. You know, I call this uh, the book burning chapter. When, when we get to that incident, you'll see what I'm talking about. But it starts off in verse one. Well, let me give you the background. There's 12 men who were baptized by John the Baptist but they were not baptized into Jesus. So these men might have been followers of Apollos, but at the very minimum, they were basically in the same position as Apollos, that they were believers that believe in Jesus, but they never got to the part where the apostles started baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ. So Paul encounters these um, 12 men. So we'll start in verse one. And it happened while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. So he found, you know, believers there in Ephesus after he left Corinth. Next verse. And he said to them, now he, now he found these disciples and he asked them a, a, a pretty um, basic question. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? You know, there are a lot of churches that, that deny the Holy Spirit. You know, they, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, oh, you receive it once you believe. This is like almost 20 years into the gospel. And yet what, the first question Paul asked these men is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? So it's obvious you don't get the Holy Spirit when you believe. Why would he ask them if you receive the Holy Spirit, if they get it when they believe? So these people that say that is, that's false teaching. So he's asking them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So now mind you, Jesus told the apostles about the Holy Spirit and it's coming, but he didn't, it wasn't until the apostles started preaching on, on the day of Pentecost. And from then on that people were taught about the Holy Spirit, but these guys never even heard the spirit. So Paul's like, wait a minute, you're disciples. You, you believe in Jesus, but you never um, received the Holy Spirit. And you, you never even heard of the Holy Spirit. Next verse. And he said to them, Paul said to those 12 men, into what then were you baptized? Because, you know, these men say they believed in Jesus. And yet, you know, he's asked. So he's like, wait a minute, you weren't even water baptized yet. So why were you baptized if, you know, <laughs> Into what were you baptized? They said into John's baptism. All right. So th these guys are very similar to Apollos where they must have been in Jerusalem and uh, in Israel around the time that Jesus was there. But then they left right before he died. So they just had a partial understanding on the teachings of Jesus. Verse four. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. So he explained to those 12, okay, yes, John baptized you, but that was for repentance. And he was 
pointing to Jesus, but Jesus is already here and he's already, he already died and he's, he rose again on the third day. So you got to get the other baptism. You're, you, you just baptized into John verse five. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right? All 12 of them were baptized because John's baptism was not sufficient. They had to get baptized in the name of Jesus. All right. Next verse six. And when, and when Paul had laid his hand on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. All right. So the evidence of being, um, having the Holy Spirit was that they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now the Pentecostals, they say, amen. But here's the thing. When you go through the book of Acts, the way the people received the Holy Spirit was by what? The laying, laying of the hands of the apostles. Paul laid his hands. It was not, let me ask and continue asking. And maybe there's sin in my life that God wants me to. It wasn't like that. If you go to remember the church in um, Samaria in, in Acts 8, they were water baptized. They believed through the preaching of Philip the Evangelist who was doing mighty signs and wonders. And yet he could not give them the Holy Spirit. A man filled with the Holy Spirit and was doing signs and wonders could not give them the Holy Spirit until they went back to Jerusalem to get the apostles so they could lay hands on them. And so it is here when Paul, when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. All right. So it was a manifestation and evidence that they had the Holy Spirit. Verse seven. And there were about 12 men in all. So I, honestly, I believe these men were followers of Apollos. Maybe they were his disciples and Apollos got separated from them because he was so busy trying to help the churches. But um, even then, they were 12, and these were Jewish men, by the way. He was not, they were in Ephesus, but these were not Ephesians men because um, John the Baptist only baptized Israelites. He did not baptize Gentiles. Verse 8, and he, Paul, entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So for three months, Paul went into the synagogues. Again, one thing, if you've been going through the book of Acts with me, Paul always went to the synagogues on the Sabbath. That was his spot. That's where he always went. He went to the Jew first. That's what Romans talk about. Jew first and also the Greek. He always went to the Jew first. And he was there for three months. Verse 9. But... But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, so in these synagogues after three months, some of them were stubborn and they didn't believe. Now, it doesn't say they were hostile. They just stubborn. You know, some people just don't want to, you know, come, come to the realization. They, they refused to do that and continued unbelief. They still didn't believe. Paul broke it down, tried to make it plain, and they still didn't believe. Speaking now, speaking evil of the way. So they spoke evil about, you know, the way Jesus is the way. And, I, and, and the thing is, one, th one thing I want you to recognize is that the believers considered that they, they would call themselves the people of the way. They didn't, it was the people at Antioch that called them Christians, but they considered themselves the people of the way. So these people were speaking evil of the way before the congregation, Paul withdrew from them and took the disciples. So in other words, he's in the synagogues with these Jews and there are some believing ones when after three months they, they were um, um, speaking evil of the way, he took them out from the synagogue. He took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. So now he said, forget this, the synagogues. I've been there for three months. And they, you know, they're speaking evil. So now I'm gonna go into the hall of Tyrannus, which is basically like an auditorium. And that's basically where the church met. And, and give me the next verse, verse 10. This continued for two years. So after those three months, he spent two years in the hall of Tyrannus so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So now he's going to the Greeks or the Gentiles in the hall of Tyrannus for two years. Verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. All right. In, in second Corinthians, it says that one of the signs of being an apostle, uh, apostle is that you do mighty signs and wonders. 
And here, Paul, God is demonstrating that he's an apostle by him doing extraordinary miracles by Paul. Give me verse 12. So, and this is what, he, what Paul was doing. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched Paul's skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. So people would go up to Paul with like a handkerchief and, you know, swipe them or an apron. I don't know if there was like a kitchen apron. What? I, maybe that's an um, a old Greek word for some um, type of uh, clothing that they used to wear. But even, let's just say it's a kitchen apron. They used to just, you know, touch Paul's skin and then they give it back to somebody who was sick or somebody that was demon possessed and they were either healed or delivered from their demon oppression. That's how mighty you know, Paul signs and wonders were that he didn't even have to show up. <laughs> they just like, oh, you know, um, hey, brother, you know, they have a napkin, you know, and then he touches it. Oh, and then they run to that house. Yo, here, here, get healed. So that's, that's how powerful God was working through Paul. Verse 13. Then some of the itinerary exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. So there were some unbelieving Jews who, who were, exorcists who saw what was happening but then they say you know what we see god working through paul we don't believe in anything paul is teaching but we see what god what paul is doing god is doing through paul we're going to do the same formula we don't believe in it we're just going to do the same formula as paul did so these jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the lord jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. So these guys are saying, I adjure you in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. They don't, they don't believe in Jesus, you know, but they, they thought, they thought that Paul had like a little system and that's how, that's how these demons coming out. So if they say the, the, the right words like abracadabra, that the demons would come out. This is what they were thinking. Next verse. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. So there were seven guys who were doing this. Next verse. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? <laughs> so the demons spoke back. You know, the demons were like, we, we're not playing this little abracadabra game. You don't believe in the name of Jesus. You know, there is power. You, know, you know, there's a song that goes, there is power in the name of jesus there is power yes if you believe in him if you're walking in his ways you know if you're not walking in unbelief <laughs> but if you're walking in unbelief and you don't believe and you try to call jesus in your crisis the demon's going to be saying jesus i know and paul i recognize but who are you you know so and and god himself might say that to you too because you're, you're playing games with the name of jesus verse 16 and the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled, fled out of the house naked and wounded. So this one guy beat down seven of those guys. Not only he beat them down, he stripped them naked. <laughs> I, I think after, you know, when he hit the first and second one, maybe the third and fourth tried to stop him, but then they couldn't. And, and then they all tried to run away, but he probably had them cornered. And then he just took off their clothes. That's how you know, oppressed this demon-possessed man was, but this is how weak they were. That they could even take one man. The Bible says uh, one will chase a thousand, two will chase ten thousand to fight. This guy couldn't. These guys couldn't take one man down. Seven of those guys versus one man with a demon. The the demon overpowered them in the man. Verse seventeen. And this became known to all the residents of of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all so everybody was like wow this jesus thing is real man you're about that guy that that beat up those seven guys and you know he, they try to say jesus but paul says it all the time it, you know the demons come out but these so jesus name was exalted and the name of the uh, the lord jesus was ex, extolled verse 18 also many of those who are now believers came confessing and divulging their practices so now believers are confessing their sins and, and, and divulging their practices, explaining what they did. 
You know, these are believers, all right? So next verse. And a number and a number of those who practice magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. All right? So there was a book burning. They burned their magic arts, all the witchcraft they had. They burnt it in fr in front of everybody. All right? So don't think that that Christianity is like a personal thing between you and God. These guys, they use it as a testimony to, to tell others, this is not of God. This witchcraft is, is, is demonic and I'm, I'm going I'm to burn my books right in front of your eyes. They, the Bible says that, that Paul preached repentance and that men should do works meet or fit of repentance. It's not just saying I repent. They repented and, and demonstrated it by their actions, by burning these books in public to let the world know, look, I'm not doing this anymore. This is garbage. This, back then, when people had garbage, they used to burn garbage. They treated these magic arts like garbage. And they counted the value of them and found it, to, found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, the thing is, when we read 50,000 pieces of silver, we're like, wow, that's, that's, that's a pretty uh, amount of, you know, we think it's like a dollar or something, <laughs> like $50,000. Um, and, and even then, that's kind of a big deal in, in you know, in our culture. If, you know, you burn stuff that costs $50,000. Let's see, that's like burning a Tesla. You know, people be like, wow, he burned his Tesla. But the thing is, 50,000 pieces of silver in today's currency would be worth $5.5 million. <laughs> so these guys burn books and witchcraft items that were worth $5.5 million. That's a pretty bold statement you're making in front of everybody. Because some people would be, be like, oh, why didn't you just sell it? You know, you get some money back. I know you don't practice it anymore. No, no. You don't want others to partake in, the, in your garbage. I don't care how much it costs. I don't care if it's worth $1,000. is worth to be destroyed. Not to, oh, well, maybe I could get $100 or $500 back. No, no. You destroy because you don't want the other person involved. These guys destroyed, burned $5.5 million dollars in front of everybody. That's a powerful witness. They're saying that this, the guy we're following is a true guy. This, the, these guys right here are trash. So, wow, that, that's a, ooh, you talk about a, a revival that, that they demonstrated by their actions. Woo. Verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily just by that action. People were very um, moved and very like, wow, what, what would cause people to do this thing and they probably were curious verse 21 now after these events paul resolved the spirit to pass through macedonia and archaea and go to jerusalem so paul wants to go back to jerusalem and he has to go through these two districts saying saying after i have been there i must also see rome so he also wanted to go to rome after jerusalem he wanted to go to rome why why to 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 watch to go into the Colosseum and, and sightsee. No, he had a missionary heart. <laughs> That's why he wanted to go to Rome. Verse 22. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So right now he's by himself again. He was with Timothy and, and Erastus, but he told them to, to go back. Verse 23. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. All right, so now, <laughs> you know, people, there were some people that were amazed and there were some people that were disturbed about this way. Verse 24, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. So this is a guy that's bringing up the issue. He, he you know, he's a silversmith. And he makes statues, shrines for this goddess named um, Artemis. Next verse. So why is this issue? These he gathered together. So he gathered all the, the silversmiths, the guys who make, make these little statues with the workmen in similar trade. So anybody associated with making these um, idols, he brought them together. And he said, men, you know that from this business, we have our wealth. All right. So he's saying, look. We, we're making money out of, you know, doing idolatry. All right, guys, next verse. 
And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people saying that the gods made with hands are not gods. All right. So that's his problem. Paul is hitting his bottom line. You know, he's turning people away from these false gods made out of silver, like in his case, and he's turning them to the living God. And these guys are upset. You know, it, it reminds me of that verse that they'll make merchandise of you. These guys would not be upset if Paul was preaching and nobody was turning or, or, or if he said, you, you could keep Artemis, your goddess and worship the God of, uh, you know, follow Jesus Christ. They would not have any problem with that. But, but because it was hitting their money, hitting them in the wallet. Now they have an issue because Paul is telling them, look, don't even follow that. That that's nothing. Those guys are nothing. Verse 27, and this is why, and this is his issue. And there is danger that not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute. So he's saying, look, you know, people are going to look at us like we're, we're garbage. We're, we're wicked people. We're making up <laughs> fake God. So our, not only are people going to talk garbage about our jobs, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. So they're not worried only about their money. They really believed in this. They really believed in worshiping Artemis. So they're like, wait a minute. Nobody will come into the temple anymore. They'll, they'll think it's just a, like a, a mythology. And that she may be deposed from a magnificence. She whom all Asia and the world worship. So he's like, wait a minute. You know, this, this way. The Jesus, the, these followers of Jesus are making such a big impact that people are going to leave Artemis and follow Jesus. Right now, she's magnificent in, in Asia and in Ephesus. But if, if this pattern continues, she's going to be like nothing, you know, like, um, like Zeus. <laughs> Verse 28. And when they heard this, they were enraged. So the, the tradesmith, the silversmith, everybody associated, they were angry. And we're crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You know, for years I used to say, great is Diana of the Ephesians. But the problem is, in the original Greek, it is the word Artemis. So there's another strike for the King James Version. They, they changed the word Artemis into Diana. It's not the word Diana. You know, the Bible says that every word of God we, uh, not one jot or tittle should be taken from the law or his word. And yet they changed the word Artemis to Diana. You know, you could tell right, right from the beginning of, of that Greek word that it's not Diana, um, Diana because it has the, um, alpha symbol. Um, if it was Diana, it would have the Delta. I'm just throwing that in for those that like to say, Oh, the King James, you know, that's the word of God. That hillbilly mentality, they, they, they don't go really deep into it. Because when you start going deep into it in the original language, you realize there's a lot of errors. Now, mind you, I'm not against the King James, but I'm against those that have the mentality like the King James is it. That's the authority. No, the word of God in the original languages are the authority. All right. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They were crying out because they were so like, like, yeah. She's a real God. So we're just going to scream greatest Artemis of the Ephesians 29. So the city was filled with confusion. So the people are like, what's going on? We hear a bunch of people saying greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. And they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Ar Aristarchus, Macedonians who are Paul's companion travel. So these guys just grabbed anybody who was following the way and they grabbed Gaius and Articus, and, and they dragged them into a theater. You know, they probably didn't even know what was going on themselves because they knew that they were Paul's companions, that they associated with Paul. Verse 30. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. So Paul, God bless him. He's, he's, a, he's a fighter. He's like, you know what? They, they want me. I'll go in there. I'll go in there. But his disciples said, no, no, no. You're too valuable to go in there. We cannot have you go in there. You have done so much for the kingdom. And so we, we will prevent you. You know, it reminds me of the story of King David where, um, where David, um, 
said, you know what, let me go fight with you guys. And the guy said, no, 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 you cannot go in. It was when his son was trying to kill him. He said, you cannot go with us because they want you. <laughs> they don't want us. You know, if they kill all of us, they don't care. But if they kill you, then it'll stop. So they were like, David, stay back. And that's, that's the mindset Paul had, that he wanted to fight. But his disciples said, you know what? You're too valuable to go in there. So just stand back. Verse 31. And even some of the Asia, Asia rocks, the Asians, people that, that were in what we call today Turkey. Back then they called it Asia. You know, today we think of Asia as Japan, China, Korea. But back then they considered Asia where Turkey and um, you know, Armenia is at. And when some of the Asiarchs who were friends of Paul sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. So I was saying, look, Paul, I mean, Paul was like really wanted to go in. He's like, I, no, I want to go in. Keep reading 32. Now, some cried out one thing. So now in the crowd, in the theater, some were crying out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why, why they had come together. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it reminds me like the riots, you know, people, you know, they're saying they're, they're protesting George Floyd, but then you got Antifa burning down stuff and then you have people looting, you know, it's just confusion, you know, and, and, and unfortunately that's how some crowds are. You know, they might, they might be one crowd that are there for a reason, but then there's other that just jump on it. And, 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 and then you're like, wait, what is this? I see people going into the foot locker. I see people burning down churches. I, I see people saying, um, black lives matter. I don't know what's going on. Verse 33, some of the crowd prompted Alexander whom the Jews had put forth forward. So in other words, this guy named Alexander was going to explain to them what was going to, what was going on. Now he was not a believer. He was against the way, but some of the crowd say, you know, I let Alexander explain to you guys what's happening. And Alexander motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. So he wanted to tell the crowd what was going on. Those that were confused. Verse 34. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, so the, the, the people in Ephesians say, wait a minute, that guy's Jewish. For, for about two hours, they all cried with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the thing is, back then, the, peop the, the Gentiles viewed the people that were following the way as Jewish because the majority of believers were Jewish. So when they saw this Jew who was not supportive of the way, they were like, oh, he's one of them. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, Jew. Because they, they associated Jews with Christianity. So that's why they were screaming that. Next verse, 35. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, so he's like, the town clerk, think of him like a, a sheriff, like um, the chief of police. When he quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. So now he's appealing to them saying, look guys, what are you crying about? We, you know that Artemis is the God, the goddess. And the thing is very inter interesting that it says that, that she's the keeper of, the, of a sacred stone that fell from the sky. So it, it seems like the people in Ephesians, they worship this of um, Artemis because a stone fell from, like a meteor fell from the sky and landed on the ground and that's where they build a temple. It reminds me of in Islam the the Kabul that there's a black stone in the middle of a desert it's probably a meteor and that's where they built this whole worship of, of, of gods and that's what the people in Ephesians did. They, they basically do what the Muslims do over there. Verse 36 Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. So he's trying to reason with these guys. Say, look, you cannot deny that Artemis is a mighty goddess and all the world worships her. So what's the big deal? And he said to be quiet and do nothing rash. Don't do something, you know, that will get you in trouble. 37. 
For you have brought these men who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. So you're bringing these guys over and these guys haven't done anything. You know, they, they haven't been sacrilegious. They haven't gone into the temple of Diana and spray painted it. Or they haven't blasphemed um, Artemis. They haven't said that she's um, worthless or anything. They just say you got to follow the way. Verse 38. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone. So he knew who were the troublemakers. It was Demetrius and the craftsmen. If they have any complaint against anyone, the courts are open. So they're like, look, you got a problem? Take them to court. You're not supposed to be causing, um, you know, stirring a commotion or that. And there are pro counsels. There are judges. Let them bring charges against one another. So we got a, a judicial system here. So if you have any problems, you take it to the court. Verse 39. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in, in regular assembly. So if you, if you want any more things, you gotta, you gotta do it right. There's gotta, it's gotta be done decent and orderly. You cannot just grab your pitchforks and say, okay, you know, that's, and scream greatest Artemis in the Ephesians for two hours. Verse 40, for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today. That's, ex you know, so this crowd was worked up and they might have gone out there and started a riot, you know, started looting and, and, um, you know, stabbing people, mugging people. Since there is no cause that we can justify this commotion. See, back then they took rioting seriously, unlike America. <laughs> if there was a riot, the, the Romans would have came down and crushed the rioting. Since, since there is no cause that we can give for this commotion, there's no reason. You, you're fighting over words and like the Jews did. Remember the last chapter, they brought up Paul and said, oh, you know, he's, uh, he's, uh, he doesn't practice according to the law. And then he's like, look, this is, has to do with words and about your law. You're, you're causing commotion over religion. So the, the, um, this guy, the deputy said, no, we're not going to have that. Verse, last verse, 41. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So when the guy finally said that, it made sense to the people. They're like, oh, you know, that's true. You know, we don't want the Romans coming and, and cause an issue. So everybody left, you know. So we'll end there. But I want you to see two things. One about baptism that you got to get, you got to get baptized in the name of Jesus. And just because you get, you believe does not mean you have the Holy Spirit. You have to. Well, according to the book of Acts, you had to have had the apostles lay their hands on you. And then we read about Ephesus, you know, how many people turned to God and they destroyed the former works that they did. They did it publicly. $5.5 million worth of items. They, they burnt up. But it also caused jealousy because people that were profiting, profiting from those that were doing it and are not doing it anymore. They're like, wait a minute, we're losing money out here. So there's always people out there that will be against you, not because of principle, because you're going to hurt their bottom line. You know, they cannot, it reminds me of the demon possessed girl that when her, the slave owners realized that they cannot make money, money, any money off of her, they, they, um, you know, they started persecuting Paul. So know that when, when people are delivered, they're, they're going to be people not happy. Demetrius the Silvers was not happy that his people got delivered out of worshiping Artemis because it was hurting his bottom line. You know, so, but we thank God that God still delivers and God watches over his saints, you know, even, you know, even when things get crazy, you know, and, and God bless also Paul that he was willing to stand. And yet, because he's such value, the saints said, you know, we'll, we'll handle this. So, you know, we should have that attitude that we should not want to back down from a fight. But wisdom also says, you know what, maybe this is not the fight God wants me to call. And the disciples had the wisdom enough to tell Paul, look, I know you're zealous, but it's not a wise thing to do. So sometimes we got to listen to counsel too, not be just overrun by our emotions. So we'll end there. Amen.